All right, so um, my name is Jake Sherman. I'm the director of the Brian Urquhart Center for Peace Operations here at the International Peace Institute. And on behalf of IPI and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this policy forum on the human rights compliance framework of the G5 Sahel Joint Force, part of IPI's project on protection of civilians. We're very pleased to co-host this event with the permanent missions of Belgium and Burkina Faso and France. The compliance framework was established by the countries of the G5 Sahel with the support of OHCHR and endorsed by the Security Council and the AU Peace and Security Council in 2017. It aims to prevent and address violations of international human rights and humanitarian law that might be committed in the context of operations by the joint force. During the Security Council's discussion on the G5 Sahel joint force on May 16th, members of the Council reiterated their strong support for the compliance framework and encouraged further efforts to fully operationalize it as a means to strengthen protection of civilians and strengthen trust with local communities. Today's discussion takes place on the final day of Protection of Civilians Week. And it's worth noting, in the context of the Secretary General's report on protection of civilians and the open debate on POC that took place yesterday, that the SG recommended the development of national policy frameworks on the protection of civilians and promoting compliance with international human rights and humanitarian law through advocacy and accountability. In particular, he highlighted that opportunities to enhance and ensure respect for the law also arise in the context of coalition operations, and specifically referred to the compliance framework developed to prevent and address possible violations of international law by the joint force as, quote, an important good practice in this area. It's therefore an, an opportune moment to take stock of the implementation of this innovative mechanism. Before turning to the panel, I would like to invite Ambassador Marc Pekstein, Permanent Representative of Belgium to the United Nations, and Ambassador Yemdago Eric Tiare, Permanent Representative of Burkina Faso to the United Nations to make opening remarks. Ambassador Pekstein. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, to the organizers for uh, inviting me to uh, just say a, a few words um, for, for the opening of this uh, very in interesting uh, uh, panel meeting. Um, of course, let me say right from the start, Belgium is a strong supporter of the uh, G5 uh, Sahel initiative. Um, and we are also a long-standing uh, bilateral partner of three of the five countries. Um, and let me say, of course, the G5 um, initiative is, is something which is truly remarkable. Having uh, five countries of the region coming together, joining forces to tackle their common challenges, I think is, is quite remarkable. It's, this is not you know, something that happens every day. Um, and it, of course, totally warrants the support of, of the international community. And, of course, that is what we are doing. And um, clearly, in the context of insecurity uh, that the Sahel region has to face, uh, it's, it's paramount to fight terrorism and to fight organized crime. But it is also indispensable to look at the, let's say, the, um, the root cause uh, of this insecurity. And in that context, I think it's clear that um, you cannot win, win uh, against terrorism if at the same time you cannot win the hearts and minds of the local population. And we know one of the, of the root causes is precisely the fact that uh, the local population, or at least a part of it, um, often feel uh, marginalized. So um, 
it's, I mean, the, the eventual success of the joint force uh, will only be there if it works to protect all civilians during its operations. And therefore, the human rights compliance should not be seen as a burden, but rather as a tool to make the force uh, more effective, stronger, and in the end, more successful. Um, let me also emphasize that this uh, initiative is, is very innovative. It goes beyond uh, the more uh, traditional um, human rights due diligence policy, as it is tailored to the specific needs of uh, the side countries. And also the trilateral technical agreement between the UN, the EU, and uh, the G5, I think is a unique uh, feature uh, that could serve also as a model, uh, maybe in the future in, in other you know, similar uh, theaters. So I'll stop here. Um, I think we have very uh, well um, versed panelists here that can certainly say a, a lot more than, I, than me. But um, let me wish you a very interesting um, afternoon. Thank you. Bonjour tout le monde. I was asked to speak in English, so I will try to, to speak in English. If not, it will be. So, uh, Mr. Gilmour, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm taking the floor on behalf of the G5 cell members, state members, as Burkina Faso as the, is the chair. And I would like, first of all, to start by thanking the IP, IPI, sorry, and the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights for inviting us to exchange views about this important issue of human rights and the international law in the context of the fight against terrorism and violent extremism related to the implementation of G5 Sahel Joint Force. As you may know, the G5 Sahel countries have been facing for a few years a continuous deterioration of the security due to the terrorist attacks and transnational organized crime. The Gen Force was created, as the ambassador said now, in order to respond to the situation by the polling of military means of the concerned countries with the support of the international community because MINUSMA cannot do it. In this regard, each country of the G5 Sahel is committed to respect human rights and international humanitarian law in accordance with the provision of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2391 of 8 December 2017 and other relevant international legal instruments. We are conscious that we cannot win the fight against terrorism and violence extremism without the collaboration of our own citizens. The protection of civilians is a priority for all countries of the G5 Sahel Joint Force. In this purpose, the military force have improved their training on international humanitarian right law with the support of the United Nations. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in, this, in the report of the UN Secretary General that was submitted to the Security Council on the 16th of this month, it was clear being mentioned that the member states of the G5 Sahel have achieved a significant progress in the implementation of the compliance framework despite limited resources. Indeed, on the ground, the team of the EU Office of the Human Rights is doing a good job, and we, representative of G5 Sahel members here, got yesterday morning more explanation from the team. And I have I take this opportunity to reaffirm the availability of the chair of G5 Sahel, the Burkina Faso, and the orders to work closely with the office for the protection of the right of civilians. We are grateful to the United Nations and all the countries and partners for their support to the G5 Sahel countries 
at this crucial period during which we are facing a lot of challenge. I will conclude by ensuring you our entire commitment to the implementation of the compliance framework and wish good and fruitful exchange to all of us. I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for these insights into the establishment of a compliance framework and uh, the beginning of its implementation. I think it's a very useful introduction to start off with our panel discussion. So good afternoon to all. My name is Nami Diradza. I'm a senior fellow here at IPI and the head of IPI's Protection of Civilians program. I will be moderating this discussion. Um, and uh, we have today an incredible panel uh, to uh, give us more details on the implementation, the lessons learned, uh, uh, lessons to be learned from uh, the compliance framework in the first year of its, uh, its implementation. So in 2017, the G5 Sahel Joint Force was established by Niger, Burkina Faso, Mauritania, Chad, and Mali to unite their efforts to address common security threats in the region, including terrorism, transnational organized crime, and human trafficking. The Security Council welcomed um, this uh, deployment and authorized MINUSMA to provide the joint force with operational and logistical support, but it also called the G5 Sahel states to establish a robust compliance framework to prevent, investigate, address, and publicly report violations and abuses of human rights law and violations of international humanitarian law related to the joint force. So a human rights compliance framework was established by the Joint Force with the support of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. The objective is to ensure that the planning and the conduct of operations are done in accordance with human rights and IHL, and that the necessary measures and mechanisms are put in place to minimize civilian harm during offensive military operations and respond to violations. So these measures include a lot of different things, including the establishment of standards for the selection and screening of personnel, rules and regulations integrating human rights, training, self-monitoring and reporting, and accountability measures. The Security Council emphasized that adherence to this compliance framework is critical in ensuring the required trust among the population and the effectiveness and the legitimacy of the joint force. So the compliance framework is often described as an innovative and promising structure to make human rights a central consideration in the conduct of military operations, and in particular, in this case, counterterrorism operations. We have uh, an experienced panel to take stock of the initial implementation of a compliance framework to discuss the details of its functioning on the ground and to gather lessons learned regarding its effective impact to the protection of civilians. So we'll introduce our speakers today. Um, Mr. Richard Gowan is the UN Director of uh, the International Crisis Group. He has previously worked with the European Council on Foreign Relations, New York University Center on International Cooperation, and the Foreign Policy Center. He has taught at Columbia University and Stanford and also worked as a consultant for the UN. Um, Mr. Um, sorry, Colonel uh, Dia Saidu, Military Attaché of the Permanent Mission of Mauritania to the United Nations. Um, Colonel Saidu previously served as the Chief of Staff of the G5 Sahel Joint Force Commander. Mr. Baptiste Martin, from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, is the coordinator of the OHHR G5 Sahel project. He previously worked for the UN missions in Sudan, the DR Congo, the Central African Republic, and Mali on protection of civilians issues led the protection of civilians and child protection teams of the Department of Peacekeeping Operations and drafted the UN policy on protection of civilians. Ms. Georgette Gagnon is the director of the Field Operations and Technical Cooperation Division at OHCHR. She manages the work of the High Commissioner's 72 field presences around the world. She has also served as director of human rights for the UN mission in Afghanistan and the UN mission in Syria. So I will first give the floor to Mr. Richard Gowan um, to gather his perspectives on the dynamics in the Sahel region and his uh, views on the compliance framework for the Joint Force. Richard? Um, <clears throat> thank you. And thank you to OHCHR and to IPI for the opportunity to speak here. Um, I am not going to drill down very deeply into the compliance framework because there are other panelists who can do that. Um, but I want to make some general comments about its strategic setting. Um, and I also want to make some positive comments about the framework. Uh, 
one of you said to me as I was coming in that you'd never seen me being positive about anything the UN does. So um, in a sense, this is a bit of a breakthrough because I do think this framework um, is important in its own right and actually an important model uh, for the sort of conflict management work the UN will be doing a lot in future. What we see in the Sahel um, are two trends, uh, both of which reflect broader global realities. Firstly, we see the fragmentation of conflict. Uh, we see conflict spreading across borders, and we see a noxious mix of uh, jihadi terrorism, drug trafficking, intercommunal violence, land-based violence, a whole range of um, uh, conflicts taking a place, um, taking place in the same region and blurring into one another. But in addition to the fragmentation of conflict, we see the fragmentation of conflict management. And what's really striking when you look at the Sahel is how many different organizations are running operations more or less in parallel. You have MINUSMA in Mali, you have the G5, you have EU missions scattered across the region, uh, you have Operation Barkhan uh, led by the French in the region too. And this, it seems to me, is emblematic of the future of conflict management. The days when you simply put a large blue helmet mission on the ground in somewhere like the DR Congo um, are passing. I think that there is a recognition that in future, peace operations are going to uh, involve coalitions of different organizations with overlapping mandates. And that's especially true in those cases where uh, terrorist organizations um, are part of the major threat. Because to deal with terrorist threats, um, it is normally necessary to look to regional actors and local actors to take on risks that we cannot reasonably ask blue helmeted peacekeepers to take. And so what I see in the Sahel is actually, I would say, parallel to what we've seen in Somalia, um, where you have a similar patchwork of actors, um, AU, UN, EU. And returning to West Africa, uh, the joint task force that was set up to deal with Boko Haram. The future of peace operations, in short, will be messy. Now, that may be necessary, but it comes with risks. There is obviously a risk that different organizations uh, will lack common strategies or even have uh, mutually contradictory strategies. There is a danger of the blurring of lines between what a peacekeeping operation like MINUSMA is doing and what more robust operations in the same region are doing. And crucially, uh, there is a risk of a loss of accountability and a loss of international oversight of what um, some of those forces doing the hardest fighting are doing. And I think that it's crucial that while we may have a more fragmented world of conflict management, we should still maintain some common standards in how we respond to conflict. And those standards have to rest, I think, on a clear common vision of human rights and the protection of human rights and the protection of civilians in conflict settings. If you don't have some common standards, you will face three fundamental problems. Firstly, you will, and we have seen this at times in the Sahel, you will see breakdowns in discipline that fundamentally alienate international forces from the local population. Second, you will have mistrust between players on the ground um, as different organizations uh, feel that they cannot cooperate effectively. And thirdly, you will face money problems because these sort of operations are not cheap. People have to fund them. In this case, the European Union is, of course, a major funder. And donor organizations are not going to support operations like G5 Sahel, to be frank, unless they feel confident that some basic human rights standards are protected. And so I think that it is uh, crucial that even if the UN is not in the front line of all operations in the Sahel, that it is there trying to maintain common standards of human rights implementation and compliance uh, with other operations. And I think that what we have seen in the Sahel is an important first step to the UN not being the operational lead, but being a norm setter and norm reinforcer alongside regional actors. And if I am right, which I'm probably not, but if I am right and the future of conflict management is going to involve more and more complex coalitions dealing with more and more complex threats, 
I think that we're going to see OHCHR ask to play this role in more and more um, conflicts, providing that sort of normative um, reassurance for donors, um, for troop contributors, and for populations on the ground. Uh, in the UK, um, where I come from, uh, we have something called a kite mark. A kite mark is something that when you, it, it's a government mandated thing, that when you see it on a product, you know that it's safe, that it has gone through standard safety um, testing. Um, so, you know, toys and so on have kite marks. And I think that to some extent that is what OHCHR is providing here. It's providing a kite mark of reassurance that um, a coalition operation will live up to the highest principles that it can. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, thank you for setting the scene and uh, reminding us that it's important to have important common standards, especially for human rights, uh, despite the fragmentation of conflict management and the diversification of all the actors on the ground when it comes to uh, military operations. So with that, I will actually uh, give the floor to Colonel Saidu, uh, who can uh, present uh, the joint force itself and maybe tell us more about the inception of a compliance framework and its implementation. Colonel? Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I will have to disappoint you because I'm going to, to present in, in French, if you don't mind. I'm not that fluent in English. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, le contexte sécuritaire, j'aimerais d'abord uh, présenter le contexte sécuritaire dans lequel opère la force conjointe du Jiangsu Sahel. C'est un, un, un environnement dégradé qui est caractérisé Euh, par l'aggravation de la menace terroriste et sa complexification progressive. Aujourd'hui, la menace qui était euh, centrée dans des, vers le nord, son centre de gravité aujourd'hui glisse vers le centre et vers le sud, donc portant des inquiétudes majeures pour les pays de la région. Euh, une autre caractéristique, c'est que cette menace est rendue en, beaucoup plus complexe par le développement de conflits intercommunautaires et une évolution inquiétante des modes d'action des groupes terroristes qui s'orientent vers l'attaque de personnes, l'attaque de symboles religieux et l'utilisation à outrance des, des explosifs. Un autre défi important pour cette force, c'est la zone d'opération extensive. En fait, nous sommes, comme vous pouvez le voir dans, ce, dans cette carte, you have three sectors and very extensive sectors for only seven battalions. So you can see that it's maybe three mini theater, theater operation rather than being uh, a one zone of action. Donc, si nous passons, uh, je vais donc skipper certaines parties for, for the sake of time. En ce qui concerne, uh, au regard de cette menace, Le commandant de la force conjointe G5 Sahel, sous lequel j'ai servi pendant cinq mois, avait, euh, sur la base de cette appréciation de la situation sécuritaire, développé euh, une vision, une vision euh, déclinée en six axes d'effort. Ce que je veux montrer ici, c'est que le, le, la, protection des, la protection des populations était au centre de sa, de sa vision. Donc, euh, parce que ce qu'il a compris, qu'en réalité, L'enjeu réel de la lutte contre le terrorisme, c'est les populations. Qui gagne des populations, gagne les cœurs et les esprits. Donc c'est là où donc, euh, il a voulu faire marquer un, un point d'effort. Et donc je vais décliner euh, plus loin toutes les activités qui ont été conduites dans ce sens. En ce qui concerne la mise en œuvre du cadre, cadre de conformité, comme on a pu le constater, le renforcement de la confiance entre les, la force conjointe G5 Sahel et les populations est au cœur des priorités du commandant de la force. Cette vision est cohérente avec euh, les objectifs stratégiques qui ont été fixés par le, le concept of operations. Et ce concept, il définissait donc trois objectifs stratégiques. Le premier, c'est la contribution à la restauration de l'autorité et, et au retour des personnes déplacées. Donc, restaurer l'autorité de l'État, protéger les populations et leurs biens et soutenir leurs biens, bien-être socio-économique. Et troisième point, la création d'un environnement propice à l'assistance humanitaire et aux actions en faveur du développement. 
À cet effet, le commandant de la force a développé tout de suite une stratégie pour la, la, la mise en œuvre de ce cadre, ce cadre de conformité. Cette stratégie repose sur trois principes fondamentaux. Le premier, c'est le strict respect et l'application de, des obligations aux droits humanitaires internationaux, aux droits de l'homme et aux droits des réfugiés, avec une attention particulière aux populations les plus vulnérables, les populations, qui, ce qui inclut les enfants, les femmes et les personnes déplacées. Et enfin, l'observation rigoureuse des règles d'engagement. Le tableau que j'ai défini sur la complexité de la menace et le nombre de, des acteurs fait que les lignes de démarcation entre le terrorisme et le crime crapuleux sont, sont, sont brouillées. Aujourd'hui, vous pouvez avoir quelqu'un qui est un terroriste devant euh, un berger qui peut devenir un terroriste, un pêcheur peut devenir un terroriste. Et d'ailleurs, c'est à titre d'exemple, la force a conduit à ce jour sept opérations majeures, mais dans, ces fiseaux, dans les fiseaux d'action, les terroristes ont observé une, une, une posture d'évitement. Ils évitent les zones dans lesquelles la force agit, soit en se fondant dans les populations ou tout simplement en allant faire des attaques au-delà du secteur d'activité de, de, de la force. Un autre axe, c'est la communication et la coordination entre la force conjointe G5 Sahel et les populations locales. Donc, l'action avec de, la, la communication avec les populations locales est, 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 est importante. D'abord, mais aussi avec les acteurs clés de la société civile. C'est par exemple les leaders religieux ou tribaux, les femmes, les jeunes, les médias et les syndicats en plus des autorités administratives locales et les forces de défense de sécurité. Donc la force a développé euh, une communication avec un panel important d'acteurs sociaux, politiques, économiques qui sont dans les zones. S'ajoute à, à cela les, le nombre de, de formations importantes qui ont été délivrées euh, par euh, l'équipe représentant donc le, le commissariat aux euh, au droits de l'homme donc, les officiers de la force conjointe G5 Sahel ont été formés sur le cadre de conformité. D'abord pour leur compréhension de ce que c'est que le cadre et ensuite pour l'intégration de ces principes et pour pouvoir le mettre en œuvre à travers leur commandement. Un, un autre élément qui garantit cette, cette, l'application de la mise en œuvre de ce, de, de ce cadre de conformité, c'est l'intégration jusqu'au niveau euh, tactique des éléments de la prévôté. Donc la force dans ses déplacements, elle est accompagnée par euh, des gendarmes qui assurent la judiciarisation de l'action de la force sur le terrain. Donc ça, c'est un point extrêmement important. Et ça me fait passer à l'opérationnalisation de la composante police dans la, for dans la force. La composante police dans la force, c'est la composante tactique qui est intégrée à la force, mais c'est également la chaîne judiciaire nationale qui, elle, prend en compte les crimes pour les faire suivre dans, vers les tribunaux. Donc, ça assure une double assurance. Sur le terrain, la force est monitorée par des, des, des personnes spécialisées présentes, mais en même temps, les cas sont déférés à des institutions spécialisées qui, elles, euh, donc, continuent la procédure. Donc, cette mise en œuvre, cette opérationnalisation de la, de la composante police est aujourd'hui très avancée. On peut noter en outre euh, d'autres euh, pas gestes extrêmement importants qui ont été faits dans le sens de l'application la, de, la, de, 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 de ce cadre de conformité. C'est notamment la signature des documents relatifs aux normes d'engagement, le concept d'opération stratégique, les, règles les, les procédures opérationnelles de planification relatives à la capture, la détention, le transfert et la libération euh, des, 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 des terroristes, la finalisation de l'acteur sur, la, sur le statut de la force, la mise sur pied d'unités d'investigation spécialisées, ce sont les unités dont je parlais tout à l'heure, qui, elles, représentent les chaînes judiciaires nationales. Donc, l'organisation de plusieurs ateliers de formation, donc, qui ont été conduits par euh, les, les, nos amis, euh, de sensibilisation euh, par le haut commissariat, et une veille stricte au respect du droit à travers l'action des prévôts qui sont intégrés dans la force. J'ai bientôt fini. Le dernier volet, qui est un volet extrêmement important, c'est le volet communication et les actions d'influence qui sont exercées par la force. Ici, euh, le rôle des, des officiers simiques est extrêmement important. Et les conseillers de communication, de presse, dans la mise en place d'un dispositif d'analyse euh, des perceptions des populations. Parce qu'il faudrait que la force ait un retour sur comment les populations voient la force. Est-ce que la force est vue comme une force d'occupation ou est-ce que c'est vu comme une force qui est avec les populations et sur laquelle on peut compter 
la signature donc d'une directive de, de communication qui intègre l'information publique, les actions sumiques régulières, euh, mais aussi l'échange d'informations et d'analyses avec les partenaires clés. Il faut aussi s'ouvrir à l'environnement euh, qui permet donc de faire appel à des expertises externes, que sont par exemple les centres de recherche, les agences nationales et internationales qui œuvrent en faveur des droits de l'homme et de la protection des civils. Donc, cette dynamique avec ces, avec ces, avec ces institutions est extrêmement, et aujourd'hui, est entamée, elle est bien lancée. Donc, pour conclure mon propos, je peux dire que la force conjointe G5 Sahel est aujourd'hui résolument engagée dans la mise en œuvre d'une vision holistique qui intègre la protection et la confiance des populations en son sein. Ceci passe nécessairement par la stricte préparation des personnels à la tâche qui leur incombe, mais aussi par l'amélioration constante des méthodes et outils d'action de la force. Parce que ce qu'il faut au sein de cette force, c'est développer une culture d'intégration du respect des droits de l'homme dans les actions militaires. Mais en même temps, une culture d'appartenance à une entité différente des, 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 des armées, qui est la force conjointe. Il ne faut pas que l'officier mauritanien se sente mauritanien. L'officier mauritanien qui est dans la force conjointe, il est à la force conjointe. Il doit agir au nom de la force conjointe. Il doit agir pour les intérêts de la force conjointe, mais pas pour ses commandements. Et c'est pourquoi... Euh, le commandant de la force a été engagé dans la consolidation de la chaîne de commandement aujourd'hui, qui est aujourd'hui effective. Donc c'est le transfert du contrôle opérationnel sur les différentes unités. Ce transfert aujourd'hui est effectif et il fonctionne. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, colonel. Thank you so much. So maybe to summarize your points quite quickly, uh, you mentioned the deterioration of the situation uh, in the region with uh, the development of intercommunal conflicts, the increasing uh, of terrorist threats, uh, and uh, the shift to, uh, from the north to the center. Um, and uh, you highlighted, actually, that in this context, uh, the force commander of the G5 Sahel Joint Force has a very clear and holistic vision based on protection of civilians at the center of, of military operations, and that a lot of activities were actually implemented uh, to pursue this approach in terms of the protection of the population. Uh, you mentioned that seven major operations were already um, conducted and that it was, of course, difficult uh, to uh, protect populations in a context of counterterrorism with a complicated uh, distinction between combatants and civilians, but that everything is being done in this regard, especially in terms of training uh, of uh, uh, joint force personnel for the compliance framework. Uh, you also mentioned that the police component is essential uh, in this regard uh, because it allows to actually involve the judicial chain in the work of, of the joint force and to ensure that there will be a follow-up in the justice system when you arrest a uh, presumed terrorist, for example. Uh, and uh, you also highlighted that communication is key. Uh, you have CIMIC officers involved in this regard with the engagement with local communities. You have communication advisors. And you realize that perceptions, local perceptions, are essential. You need to know if the populations uh, actually perceive the force in a positive way and what you can do to um, enhance the, the coordination with local population and uh, public information. You uh, repeated the commitment uh, to human rights and you called for a shared human rights culture within the joint uh, force because even if it's uh, composed of different countries, uh, the basis and the shared commitment should be about human rights and protection of civilians. So thank you so much for these details. Uh, I think I will now turn uh, to uh, Baptiste. Uh, maybe, uh, Baptiste, you, since you are actually leading the OHCHR team on the ground that is supporting the G5 Sahel for the compliance framework, you can uh, tell us more about the modalities of implementation of the framework and uh, the specific activities that uh, you uh, work on. Thanks. Thank you, Nami. Uh, so I'll try to give a few points uh, indeed and, and explain uh, how we've uh, come about the implementation of this project. Uh, so we've been uh, on the ground for a year now. Uh, so it's a short experience uh, still. We've been uh, in Sevare, in Mopti at first, uh, next to the HQ of the force. Now have moved to Bamako and we'll have uh, staff across the five countries to support all the levels uh, of the force and the army commands in the implementation of the compliance framework and in coordinating implementation with the key partners. Um, 
adapting the the approach to uh, the the G5 force uh, and that compliance framework is a uh, is a new model for OHHR. But the purpose and the objective is not new. It's compliance with IHL, with human rights, uh, with refugee law. The idea was very much to tailor it. Uh, to the, the specificities of the force, of the context, of the G5 Sahel organs, uh, and to its context. And then trying to adapt the tools, the mechanisms, uh, all, all the activities to the specificities of that force uh, in the support role for us. Um, so in terms of adapting it to the context, uh, it's, it's first the normative uh, context, uh, we agree that the launch uh, workshop of the of the implementation of the compliance framework uh, last year in Bamako that the uh, AU doctrine would be our reference uh, normative framework uh, and all uh, all the all the policies uh, that the AU can have. Uh, for example, the code of conduct uh, and discipline of, of the force we, was very much inspired from the AU uh, doctrine. We work alongside uh, on the POC aspects, uh, the POC guidelines of the AU, the Kampala Convention for IDP uh, approaches. So really the, the regional normative framework and the national one. We have this, this specificity of having battalions operating mostly on their own territory. Uh, so the national uh, legal framework is important in the way we implement uh, versus having uh, guidance across the, the force. Adapting to uh, the conflict dynamic means uh, an asymmetric environment where we have specific uh, dynamics around protection threats. The protection of sources uh, is one specific concern. Uh, the distinction between civilians and combatants uh, that Colonel Saido uh, mentioned as well. Uh, the multiplicity of armed actors uh, uh, and uh, from self-defense group to an organized armed group. And uh, in terms of mandate specifically, adapting it to an operation that is more robust, for example, compared to traditional uh, UN peacekeeping. We have the FIB experience in DPKO, uh, which required a little more uh, attention to targeting to collateral damage and mechanisms associated with it. So this is one of the focus areas for, for the force and its mandates. Of course, we have the human rights framework that apply, not only IHL, for cases of criminality, of human trafficking, uh, which is more human rights uh, law framework. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, mechanisms and, and procedures, so we have seven pillars of implementation of the compliance framework. Nami mentioned them, uh, so I will not repeat. But you can find more or less in that structure uh, a standard structure of a POC strategy that would look at capabilities and resources, that would look at mm -hmm. doctrine, at training, at uh, mechanisms and tools to coordinate the action with different actors and, uh, and elements of public communication of accountability. Uh, so I'll just give a, a few examples of how we adapt uh, it to, to the force on, on those points. Uh, the layout across five countries uh, means that we need to uh, adapt to a response that is uh, that is and in our presence and in our support uh, really uh, really uh, extended extensive as, as Colonel Saidu said and for us it's an issue of access as well to the battalions in insecure areas to provide that support um, they have actions along borders so border dynamics are very in, important in the in the way we uh, we work and the structure of the force we have the three sector HQs uh, in terms of resources and capabilities we felt the need because you have a fragmentary order and tactical rules of engagement for each specific operation developed to have and to add a, a spe special legal advisor at that sector level, so they are to be deployed in the next rotation, to have the capability inside, in addition to focal points that we've, uh, we've already established, the force commander has sent a, a directive on this, all the CIMIC officers are the focal points on the implementation of the compliance framework and on all protection uh, activities. Uh, and then we have a specific work for uh, the the ops uh, people at every level uh, to integrate POC into the planning and the implementation of, uh, of the activities. Uh, the integration of women uh, is, is uh, effective in Burkina, in the Burkina Battalion, was considered an operational advantage uh, and a good practice. And we're now going to conduct a study and organize a conference requested by the, by the G5 on the inclusion of women in defense security forces and, uh, and trying to address at the same time 
time, the cultural logistical challenges uh, associated to, to this. In terms of doctrine, I will not uh, come back. Colonel Saidu depicted a little bit what was being done. Uh, an important document we've worked on is the, is the SOFA, the update of the status of force agreement, added some elements of language on the capture, retention, transfer of, uh, uh, of detainees and a specific procedure, as he mentioned. We're now developing an, an internal investigation uh, procedure for the force and uh, working on a soldier's card for the uh, ROE, for the, for the foot soldiers, for the field commanders, uh, and as well a soldier's uh, manual uh, inspired from different uh, army command soldier uh, manuals uh, that are existing. Uh, so a lot of work on, on guidance uh, to start with, especially those operational processes, and an agreement recently to work with UCAP Sahel, UNODC, and UNPOL from MINUSMA to develop uh, a doctrine of uh, use of the provost uh, core within the force, uh, in addition to those two SOP on capture and investigation. Uh, a lot of work on training. Uh, we integrate in military training uh, aspects on rules of engagement on the police component and some specific procedures uh, but we have a specialized course as well uh, we developed with the Institute uh, of International Humanitarian Law of San Remo with ICRC uh, in partnership with the, with the French, uh, Austrian and Italian governments and we've now uh, agreed to uh, move that course uh, appropriated by the G5 uh, Sahel Defense College, uh, review the modules and will train uh, trainers in every army command so they can train their own battalions as they deploy and will be there to support them and mobilize specialists, specialized agencies, UNHCR uh, for IDP training, UNICEF on, on child protection training. Uh, so it's a lot of coordination work for us in support of the force to have standard modules uh, really on the G5 Sahel language and their own procedures. Um, and this will benefit the Army commands generally, who cover mostly IHL with the support of ICRC to cover child protection, CRSV, gender, IDP, refugees, all the other uh, thematic areas around protection that are not covered right now uh, in, in guidance and training in, in most of the Army commands. Um, Mechanisms and tools, community engagement. Uh, we have been looking and we have those uh, joint visits we organize with the force to the different countries. We're now organizing national level and local level workshops with partners, with local authorities, with humanitarian actors, with civil society. Uh, and local authorities are, are key in that setup to try and uh, coordinate the actions of the force. Uh, and to have, uh, in terms of what, is, when it comes to CIMIC activities, a good coordination and respect of the humanitarian space, uh, but as well to be able to uh, integrate information on civilians in the planning of operations uh, and really exchange uh, views on priorities. Protection clusters are key for that. We have the alert mechanisms of humanitarians on displacement of population. So all this, as humanitarians, you know, agree to uh, share some of the information, it will benefit uh, the POC uh, uh, activity of the force. Um, we're looking as well, and this is more related to the strategic communications perception analysis is important. Uh, there will be a set of, of research that will be done with the Defense College uh, on trying to look more specifically at relations between defense security forces and populations. Some think tanks are already working on this ISS, for example, based in Dakar. They've worked in operations areas for the force and will work specifically with them and the permanent secretariat on looking at tricky issues for the force in terms of implementation of its uh, compliance framework. Um, a, a last uh, tool and, and one point on strategic communications is all uh, the, the, the use we now have, uh, I mean, they have a Facebook page for the, for the G5 force uh, to start communication and some monitoring of social media uh, for all, uh, you know, possible propaganda and, uh, and as well all the dynamics that can be used through this. The use of community radios compared to the JTF, for example, on Boko Haram, the joint force doesn't have its own radio. Uh, the idea is to have standard messages and we have this, uh, this, this directive on uh, communication, which includes standard messaging for populations, and we'll work with the CIMIC officers in each country to really tailor the messages uh, to each, each area. Um, the last, last point, and this is, I think, one of the elements, and some army commands do not yet have that process of automatically conducting after-action reviews, after-operations, on a POC angle. 
and this is where uh, we're, we're helping them. We've done it internally with the sector HQs and battalion uh, plus army commands last year in all the countries. This year, we're doing it with the partners to have a 360 degree uh, evaluation of the operations and really take into account the views of humanitarians, local authorities, communities uh, to integrate in the planning and take corrective measures in terms of guidance, training uh, to, to implement the mandates. Uh, one last tool I can mention, and Civic, uh, our partner organization on the project is in the room, uh, is the development as was done uh, with, uh, with the NATO ISAF in, uh, in Afghanistan, AMISAM in Somalia, to have an internal system to capture allegations, incidents, uh, and to inform the leadership in terms of how to address and how maybe to uh, prevent, pre prevent uh, with pattern analysis uh, within the force. So that's another tool. We're working on developing it now uh, with Civic uh, and, and the Force Command. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Baptiste. Um, I will now uh, give the floor to uh, Georges Gagnon, um, but maybe can tell us more about the inception of the project from an HQ perspective and, uh, and also uh, the, talk about the potential replication of this mechanism in other contexts. Thank you, Georges. <laughs> Thank you. Um, our thanks to IPI for hosting and co-organizing co co this event with our office. Uh, very happy about that. And our appreciation to the permanent representatives of Belgium, Burkina Faso, and, and France for their participation and, and remarks. Um, the compliance framework, in many ways, is a culmination of lessons learned and best practice from years of effort uh, experience, trial and error, and achievements in conducting military op operations, whether they be in the context of counterterrorism, counterinsurgency, to address multiple security threats in ways that ensures harm to civilians is mitigated, civilians are protected, and the laws of armed conflict, IHL, and human rights law are complied with, and that there is accountability. The UN Security Council, in the resolution that set up the G5 Sahel Force, clearly recognized these lessons learned when it called for the establishment of a robust compliance framework. And what I've been asked to do is briefly highlight how the compliance framework is attempting, has attempted, and in continuing to do so, to take on board the lessons learned from these experiences uh, and take them forward, not only in, with the G5 Sahel, but in other contexts. And I'll talk about uh, Afghanistan in particular, where I worked for over five years. Uh, what, what worked there, what's been taken forward, and what challenges remain to fully operationalize the compliance framework to support the G5 force on the ground to reduce and prevent civilian harm. In developing the compliance framework, OHCHR has drawn on our experiences in peacekeeping environments generally, and more specifically, the activities and engagement that we've had in several contexts, including in Afghanistan. Now, a key lesson from Afghanistan, and there have been many studies done, and I would, I draw in particular a study that OSF did uh, in 2016, um, was the clear recognition and acceptance over time by military and political leaders of the strategic costs of civilian harm. That civilian casualties, the protection of Afghan civilians by Afghan international and other pro-government forces fostered the growth and sustainability of the insurgency, the Taliban, damaged relations among the Afghan government and its international partners, undermined the legitimacy of Afghan and international forces, and critically alienated the Afghan people and communities. Many, over many years, uh, civilians would tell us were caught in the middle between the insurgents and the Afghan and international forces. Civilian harm undermined the mission's credibility and interests its political and military objectives. And this acceptance uh, led to reforms. Early, and these formed, really, an early version of the compliance framework. And these included changes in tactical directives, planning, conduct of operations, 
after action reviews, tactics, procedures on air operations, explosive remnants of war, night search operations that put POC at the center, which resulted in greatly reduced civilian casualties by these forces. And this has been well documented. Afghan, uh, another lesson learned is that Afghan and international military, the Taliban, established civilian casualty mitigation units within their military structures, which operate to this day. Other lessons were top leaders buy-in, uh, emphasis on reduction of civilian harm, training supported by systematic data collection and analysis, including civilian casualty tracking, and feedback with interactions and inputs from external actors, the UN, civil society, community leaders from all parts of uh, the, the country, and accountability for civilian harm through what were called jayats, uh, and reparation and amends. And this contributed to improved battlefield performance, reduced civilian harm, while sustaining force protection. Uh, lessons and best practices are being applied by Afghan forces now. A work in progress, but there is a civilian casualty mitigation structure within the Afghan forces, and there are other forms for civilian casualty mitigation. Particularly in 2017, the Afghan government put in place a national policy on civilian casualty mitigation and prevention in line with best practice. And we would certainly urge and call on the G5 countries to also uh, take this on board. That is uh, uh, something that can be taken forward. Now, what was the role of the human rights component of UNAMA, the role of OHCHR, in implementing these compliance efforts in Afghanistan, um, and which we have now uh, taken on with the G5 Sahel? Uh, first, of course, our efforts were based on um, our POC mandate, uh, which uh, authorized us to provide detailed monitoring and coordination on protection of civilians, which was instrumental in driving and contributing to changes in policies and practices by military and political leaders and communities to reduce civilian harm and comply with IHL. I would say that, that our engagement provided, was the kite mark that Richard spoke about. Both the imperative for action and responsive actions by international and Afghan military were also due in part to the rigorous and consistent documentation, reporting and advocacy on protection of civilians and civilian casualties the human rights component of the UN mission did and is still doing, which provided, allowed for sustained dialogue and healthy interaction with the Afghan international forces and the Taliban. Uh, regular, as they call it, deconfliction on incidents of civilian harm provides a shared view of the consequences of operations on civilians and the changes needed to lessen adverse impacts. As we say, compliance equates to protection. Um, OHCHR's engagement uh, with the G5 Sahel Regional Peace Operations combines this direct technical support, as Baptiste highlighted, to the military on conducting operations with OHCHR's ex somewhat external monitoring and reporting. And it integrates, of course, human rights um, at the core of the security responses, as you've heard. Uh, a benefit of the compliance framework approach, and again, this was seen uh, in Afghanistan, is that in addition to the protection dividends it provides, it can provide operational dividends to the force. As noted, retaining and sustaining the support of civilian populations is essential to successful military operations in many, if not all, contemporary contexts. Uh, again, as others have pointed out here, from the Sahel to Afghanistan, Somalia, Iraq, and beyond. 
alienating populations by intentional or erroneous actions that are not adequately addressed will certainly be to the detriment of achieving what they call, in military terms, the commander's intent. Um, as you have heard, implementation of the compliance framework's elements, the kite mark, in this regard, is the establishment of the civilian casualty mitigation cells within the military forces, uh, and also the tracking, recording, mitigation work that OHCHR does in addition to that, these two complementary efforts. And uh, this takes into account the needs of local communities uh, in addition to what the force is intending to do. Uh, I would just quickly refer to the Secretary General's recent report on POC issued this month. It recalls the urgent need for ramped up action across three areas. Two of them, developing national policy frameworks on the protection of civilians and promoting compliance through advocacy and accountability are at the core of our engagement and the work with the G5 Sahel Joint Force. Uh, and of course, our work in this area and our ability to engage and work um, with our military uh, colleagues has been in large part due to the receptivity of G5 member states and their forces and commanders, Rec and their recognition of the lessons learned, the best practices, and the dividends of effectively implementing their compliance framework and the positive effects this has, particularly for civilians. Thank you. Thank you, Georgette. Very interesting indeed to uh, learn more from other examples, including in Afghanistan, where actually we could see how tools like a compliance framework can really affect change and the behavior of the parties to the conflict and also lead to long-term changes, uh, including an integration of human rights standards in, in government policies. Uh, and and I, I uh, actually appreciated the point about the, the complementarity between the efforts made by member states themselves to put in place the mechanisms, but also the complementarity with the UN that can also provide this neutral monitoring and reporting and, and can uh, reinforce uh, the whole structure of human rights compliance. Um, so with that, I will actually open the floor uh, and uh, take the questions uh, from the public. Uh, so if you have any question, uh, please can you uh, introduce yourself and, and, uh, and try to be brief. So uh, we have uh, 25 minutes for a Q&A session. Who wants to take the floor? So I have one question here. I'm glad I have a question. Uh, actually, my question is about the explicitness of victims' rights about uh, within the human rights uh, framework that you're describing. How explicit are victims' rights? Are the, is the population aware of their rights as victims when they are victimized? Uh, you just spoke about the communication with the population. You mean, here and there, you sort of used words that might imply, like you're in ODC, like reparations, etc. But how integral is this? How explicit is it? Thank you. Thanks. There's also a question in the back, I think. Merci beaucoup. Je m'appelle Joanne Lemire. My question is about the organizational capacity of the G5 Sahel. Sometimes I feel compelled to look at the website, and I noticed that there was a change in how the information uh, on the website was presented, and I, um, it looks like things are moving forward. I know there, were, uh, there was a funding conference not too long ago. I'm interested in uh, what kind of partners G5 Sahel could have like uh, maybe a think tank that's more uh, organized like a university or something that, that can enhance uh, how, the, uh, how the platforms are uh, disseminated and shared with us in the region. Thanks. Thank you. 
And I have two questions in the back. Hi, I'm Alice Dabar from IPI. Um, I'd be curious to hear more about um, accountability and in the context of this compliance framework. Uh, Betis touched on it a little bit, but more specifically, I'd be interested to hear um, in the follow-up to events in Bulikesi in Mali last year where uh, elements of the Mayan armed forces were uh, reported to have engaged in extrajudicial killings, arbitrary arrests, and uh, retaliatory acts. Um, what role the compliance framework has in sort of addressing these issues, and um, it would be interesti interested to hear about concrete steps that have been taken in the follow-up to that. Thank you. Thanks. Hello, good afternoon. I'm uh, Elizabeth Palma with the EU delegation here. So a comment and uh, a question that was uh, basically in line with the previous speaker. Um, in terms of comment, as you know, uh, the EU is a great supporter of the work that you've been done, both the EU itself and its member states. We're very happy um, to be able to support it with 10 million from the EU directly, but also seeing our member states that have been able to top up that contribution um, with an additional 7 million uh, euros. Uh, we also would like to um, express our um, appreciation um, and recognition for the great work and cooperation both with the G5 uh, Sahel countries, the FORS, the Secretariat, uh, OHCHR, uh, as well as MINUSMA, key partners on the ground. Uh, in terms of uh, comment or a question, uh, yes, I would like, uh, it would be great if you could hear a little bit more in terms of uh, what you're doing in terms of uh, contability wise, as um, has been previously said. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, so I will go back to the panel uh, and I think we'll have a second round of questions just after that. Uh, so maybe, uh, Colonel, if you want to start, we have four questions on victims' rights, the organizational capacity of the G5 Sahel, and, and the potential partnerships with actors like universities, and two questions on accountability measures with a specific example with what happened in Bulikesi last year, uh, and concrete steps that were taken in the framework of a compliance framework. Merci. Donc, euh, je ne suis pas sûr d'avoir très bien saisi la première question, qui est sur l'explicité des, des droits des victimes. Je pense que c'est quelque chose qui a à faire avec le, le droit lui-même, qui doit définir les, les droits des victimes. Et donc, euh, et la justice devrait veiller à ce que ces droits soient euh, sauvegardés et que donc leurs leur, leur droits soient pris en compte comme il se doit au regard du, de, de la législation. Je pense. Ça, euh, je ne suis pas sûr d'avoir très bien compris la question. En ce qui concerne les, les capacités organisationnelles du G5 Sahel, notamment, euh, j'ai cru comprendre qu'il s'agissait, par exemple, des de, 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 de partenaires que le G5 Sahel a, devrait développer, par exemple, avec, euh, les, comme les think tanks ou, les, ou, les, ou d'autres institutions. J'en avais parlé tout à l'heure pour dire que une force comme le G5 Sahel a un besoin extrêmement important en information et en analyse. C'est une force qui est en construction. Et c'est une force qui le fait euh, au pas de charge parce que euh, les, les forces comme le G5 Sahel mettent du temps à se construire. On a vu des exemples de forces très résilientes comme par exemple l'OTAN et les autres. Ce sont des années de travail sur les forces, sur les sensibilités des pays, sur euh, l'interopérabilité. Euh, alors que la force a réussi en très peu, de, très peu de temps à arriver à des niveaux qui sont euh, extrêmement ils sont impressionnants. Parce qu'aujourd'hui, on arrive à faire opérer euh, deux bataillons qui sont de pays différents dans un seul théâtre d'opération et avec les mêmes règles de, 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 de conduite des opérations. Et donc, on arrive à, à trouver un dialogue entre les, les autorités politiques sur des intérêts communs. Donc, la force a, 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 a ce besoin criant en matière d'information, en matière d'expertise extérieure. Elle met déjà à en, en, en profit euh, les capacités des États, notamment par exemple, il a été créé euh, euh, à Niamey il y a deux ans, il a été créé ce qu'on appelle un, une, une cellule de fusion, une cellule de fusion qui intègre les services de sécurité des, des, des États et les, et les services et les, et, les, et, les, et les organes de renseignement des armées pour la mutualisation du renseignement et faire en sorte que ce renseignement-là puisse être donné à la force G5 Sahel, lui permettant donc d'améliorer euh, sa connaissance de l'ennemi. 
mais elle se heurte à des difficultés qui sont, par exemple, les réticences traditionnelles des services de renseignement à échanger les informations. Ça, c'est un point. Et deuxième point, on sait que des organisations comme les services de renseignement, elles font du renseignement stratégique beaucoup plus que du renseignement actionnable sur le terrain. Alors que la force conjointe du 5 Sahel a besoin d'actionable intelligence, comme on dit. Et, et ça, ce sont des choses qu'elle peut obtenir, par exemple, en développant une coopération avec des forces euh, environnantes, comme par exemple le, le Barkhane, comme Il y a beaucoup de barrières qui restent à briser dans ce sens-là. Mais le besoin, il est là, il est énorme. Donc, euh, la, la force conjointe a besoin de documentation, a besoin d'information, a besoin d'analyse beaucoup plus euh, fouillée pour, pouvoir, pour lui permettre de... Euh, d'opérer euh, cor correctement. En ce qui concerne le cas de Boulkesi, je peux, je peux vous témoigner, moi personnellement, j ai, j ai, nous sommes venus à la force en fin août. Nous avons pris début septembre. À ce moment-là, il y avait ce qu'on appelait le Boulkesi 1 qui s'était passé. Mais le Boulkesi 2, entre guillemets, euh, j'ai été témoin de cet incident. Quand il s'est passé, je peux vous dire que la réaction rapide que le commandant de la force a eue à ce moment-là, était de, de demander à ce que les demander à l'assistance de la MINUSMA et de la force et, et, et l'armée malienne pour pouvoir se porter sur le sur le terrain parce qu'il y avait il y avait 15 terroristes qui avaient été arrêtés deux soldats maliens ont été tués et ces 13 il y avait deux étaient morts des terroristes étaient morts et, et il y avait 13 personnes qu'il fallait amener sur amener à, à remettre à, aux autorités euh, à la gendarmerie donc ça les instructions du commandant de la force c'était tout de suite que ces personnes soient très bien traitées jusqu'à leur remise, remise effective à, aux autorités prévotales. Et l'aménagement avait envoyé un hélicoptère pour pouvoir acheminer ces personnes. Sur le, sur le, il y a eu des conditions qui n'ont pas permis euh, cela. L'une des personnes est décédée euh, entre-temps. Et cette personne, euh, le commandant de la force avait exigé à ce qu'une autopsie soit effectuée sur, ce, sur, sur cette personne. Alors même qu'elle a été enterrée. Il a demandé à ce que l'exhumation du corps de cette, de cette personne, qui s'appelle Diko, et que ce corps soit soumis à une... Euh, que le médecin légiste voit ce corps. Donc ça, c'est une exigence qui avait été faite et à laquelle les Maliens avaient répondu. Donc le corps a été autopsié par, euh, des, a été autopsié par des médecins légistes maliens. On avait demandé aussi l'assistance, de, la participation de la MINUSMA. Je ne sais pas pourquoi la MINUSMA n'a pas participé. Et... À la date où je vous parle, le commandant de la force avait actuellement a, a requis euh, les résultats qui ont été obtenus, euh, les résultats de cette exhumation et de l'enquête qui a été faite. Et donc, les autorités maliennes ont diligenté une enquête en bonne et due forme. Et je pense que ces documents-là doivent parvenir à la force. Donc, euh, c'est dire qu'il n'y a pas de... Il est extrêmement important pour la force que son action soit, se passe, soit strictement encadrée par la loi et par le cadre de conformité. Il, faudrait qu elle, qu elle, il ne faudrait pas que la force verse dans un cas qui peut porter préjudice à sa crédibilité. Et ça, c'est un des soucis majeurs du compte de la force. C'est pourquoi il s'est employé à consolider, comme je l'avais dit, la chaîne de commandement, de faire en sorte de couper le cordon ombilical entre, ces, entre les forces de défense et de sécurité, qui sont les bataillons qui sont affectés euh, sous le commandement du commandement de la force, des, de leur commandement. C'est-à-dire qu'il les a pour emploi et ils doivent répondre aux directives du commandement de la force euh, et les autres les pays aussi, les pays membres du G5 Tael mettent un point d'honneur aussi à respecter, à faire respecter les, les droits de l'homme parce que euh, le non-respect des droits de l'homme, c'est quelque chose qui va tout simplement euh, euh, conduire à l'échec l'entreprise G5 Sahel d'une façon générale. Voilà, je vous remercie. Thank you, Colonel, for these elements um, and uh, for We're calling us that, yes, partnerships are needed for the G5 Sahel Joint Force, and especially in terms of, of uh, information and analysis. Uh, as you are building the force, everything takes time, and uh, you are counting on different partners, including Barkan, for example, but any other partnership that can help you in, in building information analysis, especially because uh, information sharing between intelligence agencies can be quite challenging and, and difficult, and you need more intelligence and, and actionable information uh, to uh, conduct your operations. So you, you really highlighted that partnerships are, are indeed needed. And for Bouli Kessi, you also um, described how the force commander himself, especially for the incident, the second incident in Bouli Kessi last year, Bouli Kessi II, um, he actually took uh, uh, action quite uh, rapidly and he instructed the forces to uh, 
uh, to actually take care of the persons that were arrested and uh, avoid any uh, ill treatment uh, and uh, make sure that these people will be transported and, and brought to the justice uh, without uh, any human rights violation and that you also conducted investigations, uh, especially for uh, this person who died during the transportation. So uh, you actually uh, uh, highlighted that you took a lot of measures to ensure accountability in this regard. Uh, so I will maybe ask other speakers to uh, respond quickly to these questions. Maybe if you can limit your answers to two minutes so that we can take other questions. Baptiste, do you want to uh, continue? Thank you. Um, maybe just to complement what, uh, what Colonel Saidu said, I think in terms of um, you know, documents within the force on how to deal with victims, we have the status uh, forces agreement, uh, which covers both if a soldier of the force is wounded, sick, uh, or killed, and uh, as well, collateral damage, victims of the force, legal or illegal, uh, and the type of compensation and amends process that would be put in place. Uh, so the SOFA is to be presented at the Defense and Security Committee in, uh, in June, normally, um, by the force commander to, uh, to have the, the legal framework, let's say, for compensations uh, in place. Um, but then it's a, it's a matter of agreeing between the force and the army commands uh, who and how we will deal with uh, those compensations and, and uh, make amends. Uh, we've had one case where, uh, and it was uh, General Hanana, uh, one, one civilian was killed killed in, in Beckett Lawash earlier this year, there was immediate action to present excuses to the family, uh, to try and look into a compensation for the family, and to expel the individual uh, from the army and, and, and put him in the hands of the justice system. Um, so in terms of amends, this time it was the uh, army command uh, with the coordination uh, engaged uh, uh, proactively by, by the force uh, that, that uh, you know, turned this process into practice. But there's no specific you know, SOP within the force right now on this. It's the legal framework under the SOFA and, uh, and a practice for every incident. Um, for partnerships, I mean, we, we have uh, one, one priority under the Project Coordination Committee. It's really to start partnerships within G5 style organs. Uh, I mentioned the Defense College. We have the Secretariat with a, a broader mandate and a lot of elements that can be, uh, you know, reinforcing the activities of the force around the compliance framework. Uh, one example I can give is all those networks of women, of youth, of journalists, and now we're looking into a network of ministers of justice and, and human rights to work on uh, regional legal frameworks to, uh, as well with the protection clusters and civil society actors. The National Commission of Human Rights have now an agreement with the, with the permanent secretariat, and we will involve them at the national level in what we do on the compliance framework through the partner workshop and through trainings, guidance, etc. Uh, so this will be determined uh, at the national level. And in terms of research, as I said, the Defense College will have senior officers working on topics uh, identified by Army commands and the Joint Force on uh, challenges they may face and, uh, and inform uh, around protection of civilian topics as well uh, the activities of, of the force. Um, on accountability, I think uh, Colonel Saidu uh, uh, gave the details on, on Bulkesi 2. Uh, so we had one incident in May, that was Bulkesi 1, uh, where 12 uh, civilians were killed. Bulkesi 2 is in October, where indeed there was this, uh, this arrest and then transfer. Um, both investigations are still ongoing by the Malian authorities for uh, May and for October uh, under the, the prosecutor in Mopti. And uh, the force has indeed uh, proactively engaged with the uh, Malian authorities to follow up on the case, which is the obligation uh, for the force, is to uh, uh, do through the legal advisor, the police advisor, and official communications, the follow up of every person captured and transferred or every uh, case of violation by, by an individual. Uh, so on the force side, we're good. Now we're still waiting for the response from the Malian authorities. Thank you. Thanks, Baptiste. Georgette? Um, just Two quick points on victims. Uh, I would just highlight something Peter Maurer from ICRC said at the open debate on uh, POC earlier this week. He said that uh, what's needed to do effective POC or how they're doing at ICRC is not to take a victim-centered approach, but a people-centered approach. And uh, that uh, people and communities are often the best agents of their own protection 
And that's why it's so critical to uh, work with communities on the self-protection, um, their self-protection measures. Um, and um, we would certainly echo that. On the accountability, of course, uh, a key role of, of OHCHR is to provide an impartial uh, investigation into various incidents, either uh, of our own accord or at the request of, um, of others, and, and bring that to, uh, to those who can uh, take up um, um, concrete accountability work. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. Uh, so I think there was one question here. If there are any other pressing questions, now is the time to indicate. Okay, so one question. <clears throat> Thank you. My name is Harna Suge. I'm a former UN military staff and a retired colonel from the Ethiopian Army. So considering my military experience, I would like to ask two questions related to the military. The um, compliance framework is already, I mean, in my view, it's well uh, established. The thing is, when we talk about compliance, it's about implementation, and the implementation is at, lo at the lower level, militarily, the tactical level. So, um, of course, the leadership is very important. Uh, when we talk about the implementation in military, the IHL, the human rights protection on the ground, uh, the concept of operations, the CONOPS, how, to what extent are uh, this kind of spell out about the protection of civilians in terms of fighting the uh, extreme terrorism. And based on the concept of operations, how about the operational orders, operators which are written, signed by the force commanders? To what extent are they spell out? Because I'm, I'm mentioning this thing when we, got, when we think about the military, military in its own culture and the way we are used is articulate, specific, and short orders. We need that. So in short term, in a specific manner, uh, to what extent the operators for the, from the force commander, the fragos to the tactical level regiments, how are they addressed to implement this framework? Uh, are you monitoring, or to what extent are you monitoring the consistency between the strategic level conops and the tactical and operational level. The second question I have is, uh, as it's mentioned, there are fragmented uh, forces uh, fighting the extreme terrorism, or I can say friendly forces, like the uh, Purkan French and MINUSMA and the G5. So uh, the coordination level in terms of uh, how they are reading each other, at the, to, to make them at the same page, like at the planning level, at executing some operational military operations, to what extent are they reading each other? What kind of uh, uh, forums are established to read these, I mean, these forces to read each other uh, at planning or at executing? What kind of uh, operational coordination is m being made? to avoid casualties and even between each other. Thank you. Thank you so much. So a very quick <laughs> last question, and then I'll, I'll give uh, the floor to a panel. Thank you very much. I'm Paul Grasse from the Mission of Portugal, and it's really very quick in the follow-up of this question and previous ones. I was just wondering if there is any trickle down that can be noticed already from the human rights compliance frameworks to the national level of the G5 style countries, also taking into account uh, the Secretary General's report and the need for national frameworks for POCP. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so, Baptiste, do you want to start? Uh, I would advice to take one minute only for answers and concluding remarks. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, well, for the first question, uh, you, you mentioned the, the, the CONOPS. Uh, I mean, we have a strategic CONOPS that is really a, a document meant for the, for the HQ of the force, but we have a lot of more operational and tactical documents uh, that are being prepared specifically uh, for the guidance of the battalion and company commanders. Uh, in relation to the compliance framework. 
I've mentioned the SOPs on capture, on uh, internal investigations uh, for the provost corps and for the, uh, the army commanders. We have the soldier's card, which is an interpretation in simple terms of the rules of engagement for the tactical level. Uh, and we'll have the soldier's manual for every situation a battalion uh, can encounter in terms of uh, relations, incidents with civilians on what to do, what not to do. Uh, so this is uh, for rules of engagement and the use of force for the, uh, any situation uh, dealing with displaced, with an individual uh, child found in an armed group, with a woman that is raped, etc. So having tactical guidance was a priority for the compliance framework. Uh, and disseminating it is a challenge. We have regular battalion and company commanders trainings uh, taking place at the Ecole uh, of a Peacekeeping School in Bamako with EUTM support uh, and, and the J7 from the force. The, the, the training officer, uh, but uh, we can't have everyone uh, come to the HQ and we're trying at the national level indeed to accompany the army commands to train the battalions in pre-deployments. That's the responsibility of the army commands and uh, this is why we're planning this training of trainers uh, this year uh, on all the topics uh, to disseminate that guidance as well, those procedures, those uh, those soldiers' cards, etc. For the, for the tactical level. The, the second question, we have indeed, I mean, national uh, frameworks that are existing, existing laws, existing even strategies to respond to uh, the crisis. For example, the PSIRC in the, in the, for the center of Mali. Uh, we have a, an emergency plan for the Sahel region in Burkina. We have, so we have to work uh, and, and adapt what we do at the national level to what the army command requires, to what the government's uh, position will be. And this is uh, for now for the partners workshop and what we uh, want to do for the way forward is have the, the permanent secretariat with their broader mandate uh, that will engage politically with uh, each country and try and work on these uh, national frameworks because it goes beyond just the military. Uh, it's the justice system, it's uh, the legal uh, frameworks. We have this uh, cooperation agreement uh, judicial between some of the countries we have protocol for the extraction of kids. So all this can be done uh, in partnership with Secretariat and at, at the national level. Thank you. Thanks, Colonel. If you have uh, one last word. <laughs> uh, Richard, uh, you wanted to provide some concluding remarks as well. You had some remarks. Um, this is more a comment inspired by the question about coordination than a, a response to it. Um, but I, I simply wanted to add at the end of this uh, conversation that in addition to thinking about what we can do tactically to mitigate um, violence, we do also need to keep, keep focusing politically um, on how we deal with some of the root causes of the conflict that um, the Belgian PR rightly highlighted. Um, my colleagues from crisis group in the field frequently point out there are opportunities for dialogue with jihadists, including jihadi groups that have been um, quite badly mauled militarily um, by local forces. And um, I think that looking beyond the immediate human rights challenge, I just wanted to flag everyone has to work on those political opportunities too. Thank you, Richard. Um, I think this was a, a very interesting uh, discussion from the panelists. I would like to uh, uh, give the floor now for concluding remarks to uh, Ms. Shewas Gasui, the legal counsel and head of human rights of the Permanent Mission of France to the United Nations. Uh, maybe at the end, Ambassador, I can give you <laughs> just. <laughs> I think Shewaz will provide concluding remarks, and then Andrew, okay. and at the end. Abby. Mm. Oh. Yes, Mr. Yeah, Your Excellency, can, can you provide some remarks after Mr. Okay. Thank you so much. I think you should. It's a question or no? Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I'll be very brief in any case. I'm so sad I'm not speaking French because I had prepared my remarks in French, but it will help me go even faster. So uh, I think we, as France and uh, many here, we are really convinced that uh, G5 uh, Sahel Joint Force have to succeed. And we are encouraged by the interventions that we have heard here from uh, the briefers. And thank you, IPI, uh, for hosting us uh, today. Um, maybe uh, I don't have to go back to the role we played here in the French mission with regard to resolution uh, 2391, 
But I wanted to point out to some challenges ahead of us uh, with regard to how we make uh, this compliance framework alive and live in the long, uh, in the long run to effectively help the joint uh, force uh, be a success and accepted on the ground. So the challenges are for uh, us on the, there are three types of challenges. First one, the financial uh, challenge, availability of resources in the long run uh, for the compliance uh, framework. Uh, it has been said earlier by the EU delegation, we had the chance to uh, be able to count on the support uh, of the EU uh, uh, so far, but we have to think on how to make the resources uh, sustainable in, in the long run. And uh, we, we want to open and throw the discussion about uh, UN regular budget uh, supporting financially uh, the compliance framework uh, in, in the long run. Uh, second challenge, uh, the political follow-up. Uh, we believe that there is a need for a strong regular political follow-up by the UN Security Council. And I think it also go back to um, some of the questions that has, were raised with regard to um, impunity and judicial uh, accountability. Uh, of course, the Security Council have, has sorry, uh, endorsed and launched the concept of the compliance framework, so it has a responsibility. Uh, violations have to be followed by appropriate investigations and uh, prosecutions. Uh, we believe that placing um, the G5 Sahel international support and the compliance framework under Chapter 7 uh, of the Charter could give some leverage, leverage to the UN Security Council in this regard. Uh, finally, uh, we want the G5 Sahel and its compliance framework to be uh, a success, and uh, we hope to see it duplicated by other uh, regional forces. We know that African Union have discussion uh, on uh, such compliance uh, framework, and we encourage continuing this, uh, this discussion with the help of OHCHR, among others, and I have forgotten <laughs> to pay tribute to OHCHR on the ground. Uh, in Geneva, in New York, on this important uh, issue. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I have the ambassador of uh, the Marian mission uh, to the United Nations that wants to say a few words before we conclude the session. So, ambassador. No, thank you. Very briefly, I would like to uh, thank uh, IPI, the mission of uh, Germany, Belgium, Burkina Faso for and France for co-organizing this uh, very important meeting. I'm really proud of the fact that, very happy to see that the room is still full of people showing the interest of the international community to our <laughs> the situation in the Sahel. The comment I would like to make are very, very few. Uh, I know the case of uh, Bulkesi has been raised in terms of what, what accountability uh, the G5 Sahel or the country concern is providing. Actually, Bulkesi, one, what has happened the immediate action taken by the Marian Authority was to withdraw the unit involved in, the, in, in this one. And within the unit, some elements were clearly identified as being involved in it, and they have been arrested. Investigation are going on. The delay is, is explained by the fact that uh, we don't have um, a, a state presence, a full state presence in the region to conduct the investigation, and the fear of people to cooperate with the prosecutor to, have, to gather all the conflicting versions of what has happened in, in, in this region. But I can commit, I can tell you that the government is committed to investigate and to put in, uh, it, in uh, uh, an end to this ongoing violence on the ground because we are convinced that we are not going to have lasting peace in our country, lasting peace in the region, while we are continuing to violate the, the, right, the basic right of our own people. So there is no impunity, there is no uh, will in our, on our side to hide anything. It's our own people, it's our own country, it's about the stability of our own region, so we are, we are committed to, to do that. While we are doing this type of exercise, I would like to question the fact that the situation is getting worse on the ground. Every day, our soldiers are being killed, the civilians are being killed, the crisis is extending in everywhere. So sometimes we have to question the strategy we have put in place so far. Is it working, actually? Are we gaining the war? Are we losing? I think we cannot do without doing this exercise to see what change can we uh, uh, bring to our strategy to end the instability, the ongoing instability in Mali and in the region. I think this exercise is needed, 
But while we are discussing here, people are being killed, the crisis is being extended. So what new strategy do we think is better to have in Mali and in the region to end this ongoing violence? Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Um, I will now give a floor to Mr. Andrew Gilmore, Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights, for concluding remarks. Thank you very much indeed, and IPI for organizing this, all our diplomatic friends, including you, sir, for doing that, and for our panelists. I won't mention them all, but I would just like to thank Richard for breaking the habit of a lifetime and saying something very positive about one of our UN projects, and um, may, may it start a new trend. But um, he made a number of very important points, actually, he, despite being the most concise person in the room. He made a number of important points, one of which was stressing the, that this is something that, that, whether it's the G5 or whether it's for other operations, um, donors are going to feel much more comfortable if they feel that human rights violations are not going to be committed. And th this is a very important point, because because um, it is therefore, it's different. Sometimes they get confused, but some, it is actually very different from the human rights diligence policy, which is aimed specifically at is being a, it's a risk mitigating measure for the entire organization. Whereas the, the um, compliance framework is something different. What they have in common is, is the aiming to stop human rights violations. But it's very different. It looks at it from the other way around. It, it's an enabling measure to allow the G5 force to, to, to actually receive assistance um, and not trigger all the, the negative effects of the human rights due diligence policy, which is a very important policy. But um, I just wanted to make, so that was one of the sort of three points I wanted to make based on this discussion. Um, Mark, the Belgian ambassador, thank you for your comments on the pioneering nature of this initiative, and I, I believe it is that, and uh, it's very, innovative set of measures. What it moves away from is what some people see, but often unfairly, as a caricature of OHCHR and the rest of the human rights movement, which is finger pointing and naming and shaming. This is not about that. This is about trying to support a, a, a regional force that's confronted by an extremely unpleasant, merciless enemy, and with massive regional implications beyond the G5 to elsewhere. And so, uh, but to do that in a way, which is our primary aim in OHCHR, which is to reduce or prevent human rights violations. But we do this, as I said, not by finger pointing, but by actually working with the, the forces, the five forces under force concerned, it, it is in a way to sort of speak their language, do it in a way that they find constructive, not, not speak with sort of legalistic human rights jargon, but to do it in a way that the military and the security forces can understand. To do it in a way to ensure that training is not the only issue here. It starts with screening and ends up with accountability measures, but it's a whole innovative package of measures that that's what actually makes it new. So this, this is a, a, you're actually right, sir, to call it pioneering. I, I think it is, and I'm very proud that you're, you're there to support us on that. Uh, what is absolutely crucial um, is, is the need for the five countries to feel absolutely full ownership of this. And then beyond that, the, the AU, one hopes, particularly if it is expanded to other operations, both uh, regional and indeed, for example, in Burkina Faso, where, uh, where we're hoping that the national efforts to confront terrorism, some of these lessons learned could be used for that. But it must not be seen as a donor-driven exercise, and we are very keen to, to make sure that it isn't. Um, finally, and just to say that um, this is a, we can't do it alone, and everyone understands that the compliance framework, because it's rather complicated and it's got so many different facets, has to be done by a whole range of actors, and it is being done so, such in, in that way. And that this is a, a living experiment, a living experience. We're going to um, need to adapt this constant, uh, constantly, and, and if it is going to be the model, as two or three people have said today, a model for future operations, and we have to really make sure this one works. And it's only going to work if we show the flexibility and the ability to adapt. So thank you so much for organizing this. It's much appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Gilmore. Uh, I think we had an excellent discussion. Uh, I really want to thank our panelists for the details they shared about the implementation of a compliance framework, which appears as such an innovative tool. Uh, and they also talked about the remaining challenges and the lessons to keep in mind before we replicate such a model elsewhere. And we really appreciate it of that. So thank you all for participating in this event. And please join me in thanking our speakers today. Thank you.